First, though, let's head just outside the House of Commons, where government House Leader Karina Gold is with us live. Hi, Minister. Great to see you again. Thanks for making the time. Hi, Vashti. Glad to be here. That exchange was precipitated, not precipitated, but came after a, a very specific demand made from the Bloc Québécois of your government that you essentially passed two pieces of or private members' bills they've put forward, one on supply management, one on old age security, by October 29th. Will you do that? Well, Vashi, uh, I'm not going to negotiate in public, but what I can say, and as I've told you and many others before, I speak with all House leaders on a regular basis, and uh, my job as the uh, government House leader in a minority parliament is to negotiate with all House leaders at all times. So are you negotiating? Can you be clear? Because uh, Mr. Blanchet seemed to imply that there, were, there was very little discussion happening at this moment. How would you characterize the nature of your discussion specifically with the Bloc? Well, as I said, Vashi, uh, I don't talk about those things publicly, but what I can say is that I am always in conversation with uh, all of the House leaders of all of the different political parties uh, and on a constant basis. So specific to what they're asking, though, and I, I know you're not going to come on here and say, you know, by October 29th, <laughs> we will do exactly what the bloc says. I, I understand that point. But I do have questions about this piece of legislation, which has been before the government for a few years, which, in fact, liberals voted against as a private member's bills and other other parties voted in favor. That's the expansion of old age security. Your government brought in an expansion, a, a, a 10 percent add on or uh, top up for uh, pensioners over 75. The bloc wants to expand that to all Canadians over the age of 65. Are you on principle open to doing that? Well, Vashi, we feel very strongly that uh, when we brought in that top up for pensioners over the age of 75, there is a very strong policy reason for it because we see that Canadians, once they reach 75, their expenses go up. And so it makes a good policy sense to do that. And it's a good thing for our Canadian seniors. Remember that one of the very first things that we did when we came into government was increase the guaranteed income supplement by 10% for seniors as well. So we're very proud of the record that we've had when it comes to supporting Canadian seniors. What does that mean, though, about expanding it? You are very specific in your answer to talk to those who already received the top up or talk to about those who already received it. What about those who are between the ages of 65 and 74? Do you not see a policy imperative to address that? So why the reason why that we did it for those 75 and over is because, as I said, that there is a very clear increase in expenses, uh, as well as a decrease in the savings that folks have uh, after they reach the age of 75. And so there is a very clear policy uh, reason why we did that. Uh, but as you mentioned from the outset, uh, you know, I'm certainly not going to talk about um, you know, those conversations uh, in public. But what I can say, and I will reiterate, is that we, and me in particular, am having conversations with all of the House leaders on an ongoing basis um, as we move through this minority parliament. Sure. And I'm not asking you, I guess, to, to you know, tell everybody what's involved in those negotiations. But we're, we're talking about something that a party has said they are willing to take your government down over, something you do have a voting record on, voting against, and something that would cost Canadian taxpayers an extra $3 billion a year. Your last budget was entitled Generational Fairness. Elderly benefits amount to $80 billion, far more than any of the benefits you're directing towards younger generations. Are you willing to trade, trade off, I guess, younger Canadians in exchange for staying in power? Like, how far are you willing to go to stay in power? Oh, again, Vashi, as I said, I talk to all of my House leader counterparts uh, on an ongoing basis, even the Conservatives on a daily basis, uh, as we're managing the business of the House. So that's about all I can say uh, on this regard. So you won't be equivocating a position. C can I interpret, for example, that your government voted against this PMB as its position on this, or you're just not going to tell Canadians where you fall on this because it involves you staying in power? Uh, I think those are assumptions that you are making um, and you're putting words in my mouth. But what I am saying is that I am continually engaging with all of the House leaders on a wide variety of issues at all times. And that's just how minority parliaments work. Um, and those conversations happen on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm certainly not trying to put words in your mouth, Minister. I'm trying to figure out on behalf of Canadians if in a month you're going to decide to spend $3 billion a year on something that would mean you stay in power. 
And as I'm saying, my job is to continually engage with all of the House leaders of the different parties uh, on a wide variety of issues to make this Parliament work, and that's what I'm going to do. Do you anticipate you'll be able to update Canadians on the progression of those discussions anytime soon? Uh, that is, uh, you know, something that we'll just have to see because there's many different things that we're talking about at all times. And my job is to continue to engage with all House leaders at all times um, on a whole wide variety of issues. Um, and that's the Bloc Québécois, that's the NDP, and it's even the Conservatives to advance important things for Canadians. Like last week, we passed unanimously through the House Bill C-76 on Jasper, and that happened with all four party support. So even though the Conservatives are playing these political games about non-confidence, we are able to work together on occasion to move things forward that are good for Canadians. Your office, and you specifically, are uh, in charge, essentially, in, in layman's terms, of scheduling these kinds of votes that, that took place today, or scheduling, rather, the days that the opposition has that they can do that. The bloc will be afforded an opportunity at some point. The NDP, uh, the Conservatives have another opportunity, I, I believe, tomorrow to introduce something that will be voted on next week. Is it still your intention to keep these rolling out on a regular basis? Yep. It is. So just as in any other normal parliamentary session, so there are 11 and a half weeks in this fall session. There are seven opposition days, uh, five for the Conservatives, one for the Bloc, and one for the NDP. And uh, as we do normally, uh, we'll keep rolling through them uh, in a kind of regular fashion. And just when it comes to what your government will do, aside from all the stuff we're talking about when it comes to your survival or whether or not you, you stay in power. I, I wanted to actually ask you about the agenda that you intend to put forward in, in this sitting because I, I hear you and, and your colleagues often talk about getting things done and, and the desire to do so, but it's, it's essentially a continuation of stuff that was already introduced. And it, it coincides with some interesting rhetoric from the Prime Minister around people, uh, I, I think he said in that interview with uh, Stephen Gabo, uh, pardon me, Stephen Colbert, uh, Stephen taking Colbert. their frustrations <laughs> out on him. Yeah, Stephen Colbert, my, my apologies. Taking, uh, Canadians taking their frustrations out on him. I don't think him. Gabo quite Minister has a late night audience, but. <laughs> not quite the audience. We, we, we don't know what will happen, but yeah, I take your point. Um, Minister Duclos on the weekend in conversation with me said that people, you know, he, he essentially said that the people who voted against your party in Montreal uh, after, you know, door knocking there weren't dissatisfied with your government or what you're doing, but felt unsatisfied, he said, quote unquote, with where they are in life. I feel like there's this emerging narrative from ministers and the prime minister that this isn't about what you guys are doing or what you aren't doing, but rather just people are upset at their lot in life and they're taking it out on you. Isn't that kind of like blaming the voter? And do you have any more to put in the window to address these frustrations? Yeah, look, I mean, I don't think it's uh, blaming the voter. I think Canadians are, you know, feeling the pinch right now. And I think, as I've said on this program before, and as I've said many times, it's, you know, natural for them to take out those frustrations on a, on a sitting government. But when we talk to Canadians about the things that we're doing um, as a government, they, they like them, right? They, they want dental care to keep going. They want to ensure that there's affordable child care. They want us to keep fighting climate change. Um, um, so there's a general, I think, kind of agreement, um, you know, not with every Canadian, but with lots of Canadians about the policy direction. But, you know, when it's hard to, uh, you know, pay for your mortgage because interest rates are high or uh, the grocery bills are high because of global inflation, I, you know, I, I understand where Canadians are, are coming from. I think, um, you know, what we are trying to get across um, and what we need to do a better job of is the fact that, you know, the choice that Canadians will have in the next election, whenever that may come, whether that's, you know, in six weeks, six months or, or a year from now, is that things aren't going to get better if you have a conservative government led by Pierre Polyev who wants to cut the programs that Canadians rely on and who wants to, you know, get rid of the government services that Canadians rely on. I mean, we started off the top of this program Program talking about pensions. I mean, Pierre Polyev was part of a conservative government that wanted to raise the age of retirement from 65 to 67. That would have put hundreds of thousands of seniors into poverty. Um, so there are, you know, going to be real choices for Canadians to make. And it's not, you know, the fault of Canadians um, when they're going to the ballot box. It is absolutely on us um, as 
leaders in this government, as politicians, to uh, do a better job of explaining to Canadians what we stand for and showing them uh, what we have been able to deliver and what we're going to be able to continue to deliver. And when you ask about the agenda, um, you know, we are obviously still debating legislation um, that we've already put forward that, you know, we want to get through the House of Commons, like uh, things like uh, the online harms bill or lost Canadians to make sure that we make um, citizenship more fair when it comes to uh, the descendants of citizens. But there's also things that, you know, we're going to be putting forward uh, when it comes to the Safe Long-Term Care Act. I mean, you know, a lot of us would like to forget what happened in the pandemic, but, you know, the absolute tragedy that happened in long-term care centres across this country needs to be addressed. And so there's something right. that we're going to be putting forward, amongst other things. Okay, but but you, you had already signaled that, that that was coming. I guess my question was more about what more you will put in the window to meet the moment of crisis that many Canadians feel that they're mm -hmm. in. And just a quick fact check, I take your point on raising the age of eligibility under the Harper government, but I point blank asked Andrew Scheer, your, your counterpart in the Conservatives over the weekend on this network, whether or not they would do anything to remove pensions, and he unequivocally said no on that point. And the second point I, I guess I would put to you with, with great respect is the, the link that seems to be missing is any, any line of responsibility for the position Canadians find themselves in. And again, this isn't me saying it's all your fault. Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, ca caused all of this. But there are specific policies that your government was discernibly late to the game in, a, in, in putting forward to address the very issues that you highlight. It's not just because interest rate, rates went up that mortgages became expensive. It's because the cost of housing went through the roof. Your party ended up addressing it, you know, two years after that cost started being incredibly high compared to where it was during or before the pandemic. Immigration levels started to surge for 18 months before your government took any action. Grocery prices had already reached a crescendo and the Competition Bureau had come out and six months later, your party came out and said, well, now we're gonna address issues around competition. Where is the admission of we played a part in this and why is it absent from the reasoning of your recent losses? Well, look, I think particularly when you talk about the Competition Bureau, I mean, it, and a, for a long time in Canada, we didn't have to have really strong competition rules because there was just better following of the rules. As we see, you know, more and more uh, kind of... Um, uh, overtaking of certain sectors by one or two companies, uh, we do need to beef up those competition rules. So it is responding and reacting to the moment. Um, of course, the pandemic had a huge impact on all three of those issues that you mentioned. I mean, part of the reason why there was a, you know, a spike in immigration is because for two years, we had pretty much uh, shut down immigration. And so there was a big backlog. So this is all things that, you know, happened as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, yes, decisions but you were, in were power taken. And, and now they're... And, it, it fair, yes, Fashi, but what also happened is that, you know, we needed to respond to the moment of the pandemic, which I think our government did exceptionally well in supporting Canadians get through that. Of course, there's going to be ramifications. And as we learn about those, we adjusted and we pivoted to respond to what the needs of Canadians are and were and are going to be in the future. And so that is absolutely something that, you know, by us making those pivots and recognizing that we need to make that change, I think is demonstrative of the fact that we are a responsive government to what the needs of Canadians are. I, okay, I know your time's limited. I would just say that the pivot to many Canadians might have come a bit late, but I take your point. Minister, I'll leave it at, at that note. Thank you very much for making the time for the conversation. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me.